Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's talk, sponsored by the Central Asia Working Group, working group under the auspices of the Institute of East Asian Studies at UC Berkeley. This is an initiative that aims to bring Eurasia into focus by fostering campus-wide dialogue between faculty, visiting scholars, and graduate students working on the region. Today, my co-host is my colleague, Marissa Smith, an anthropologist specialized in Mongolia, who is also a member of the Central Asia Working Group. Before introducing the speaker, I just want to say that you can type in your questions by clicking the Q&A tab. We will try and get to as many of them as possible at the end of the talk. For any technical issues, please use the chat tab at the bottom of your screen. Our speaker today, Tatiana Trudakova, is a social cultural anthropologist with research interest in post-socialist healthcare, the politics of medical knowledge and SDS. Her first book, Mixing Medicines, Ecologies of Care in Buddhist Siberia, published with Fordham in 2021, follows Russia's official medical sector's attempts to reinvent itself through state-led initiatives of medical integration that aim to recuperate indigenous therape therapeutic traditions associated with the state's ethnic and religious minorities. Based in Buryatia, a traditionally Buddhist region on the border of Russia and Mongolia, known for its post-Soviet revival of Tibetan medicine and shamanism, the book traces the uneven terrains of encounter between indig indigenous healing the state and transnational medical flows. Her current research project, tentatively titled A Sample of One, Self-Experimenting Publics and Citizen Science, analyzes practices and communities that speak to the scientific method from the fringes of legal and regulatory authorization, but nonetheless claim both methodological rigor and an ethical stance. Please join me in welcoming Tatiana Trudakova. Thank you so much, Frank, from the, for this uh, lovely and generous introduction. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and thank you all for coming <clears throat> and listening to this talk. Um, so let me just really quickly share my screen um, and we'll get right to it. Um, okay, so I'll, um, I'll start right away. So just a quick note, the structure of the talk, I'll, I'll talk a little bit to just introduce the book and kind of give you a broad overview of what this is about. And then I'll tease one argument out of um, the kind of overall project and then give you um, kind of a couple of vignettes to help it to help situate it, um, and then we can just open it, uh, up for Q and A. And please feel free to ask me if you know anything is unclear. If you want to follow up on any threads, um, in any case, without further ado. In post-socialist Buryatia, an ethnic minority region of the Russian Federation located on the border with Mongolia and where mixing medicine is set, the Russian state's relationship with indigenous and minority th therapeutics has been inconsistent. Over the last three decades, and arguably much longer, it has toggled between enthusiastic endorsement, strategic indifference, attempts at formal regulation, and outright criminalization. Alternatively formulated as an aid to, to a beleaguered healthcare infrastructure as a questionable treatment of last resort, therapeutic practices labeled traditional are caught in a bind. They are at once overburdened with the task of redressing the country's uh, public health crises and themselves frequently blamed for perceived national illnesses. Based on 20 months of ethnographic fieldwork carried out in Buryatia between 2006 and 2017, the book is an ethnography of therapeutic life at the peripheries of the state. It asks what it means for certain forms of care to occupy a space at the cusp of uncertainty in the marginalia of patients' quests for therapy, where the very existence of a culturally marked therapeutic approach is at once validated, commercialized, and disavowed. I argue that debates over traditional medicine in Buryatia encapsulate broad, broader questions, such as those of the relationship between Russia and Siberian indigenous minorities, about whose histories count in post-socialist times, and about what constitutes both medical work and working medicines. In sum, traditional medicine is a contested terrain used by both the Russian state and the local Buryat population to articulate novel futures and ways of life. In 2006, Russia's federal government launched a national initiative entitled Zdarovia, or Health. It was one of the four national priority projects aimed at increasing, in the words of Vladimir Putin, the population's quality of life. Zdarovia targeted the healthcare system nationwide and was meant to improve Russia's health through lifestyle education, 
financing the modernization of medical equipment and expanding the availability of primary care. But its fourth pillar was to revive a commitment to preventative and rehabilitative medicine. This latter emphasis promoted new forms of care rooted in the integration of both, quote, traditional and, quote, folk medicine, citing the non-invasiveness of plant-based therapies and suggesting that traditional medicines were well-suited for addressing the systemic chronic dysfunctions that plagued the nation. Non-biomedical modes of treatment were suddenly imbued with the capacity to readjust citizen bodies to social, economic, and environmental conditions of post-socialist life, increasingly defined as pathogenic. At first glance, there is something uniquely cosmopolitan to how ethnic and folk medical integration captured the institutional resources and intellectual curiosity of medical professionals in Russia and appealed to a broad public engaged in the pursuit of healthcare. But it also is paradoxical. The popularization and increasing formalization of ethnically and culturally marked forms of care in Russia is unfolding amidst the return to robust ethno-nationalism. Ethnic medical pluralism seemed to run counter to the kind of strong state model in, of, in Putin's Russia, a program often figured as a return to centralized power and top-down national homogenization. This has been a period marked by xenophobia, the rejection of social justice claims for their links to Western values and agendas, and it is beset with efforts at political consolidation. The rise of an indeed ambiguous state embrace of culturally marked therapies that depart from conventional biomedical treatment and that tend to foreground historical and cultural differences stands at odds with other developments in the national sphere. When I conducted my ethnographic research, Buryatia found itself at the forefront of the state's budding enthusiasm for therapeutic plurality. Along with Buddhism, a local tradition of Tibetan medicine had been progressively revitalized in the Republic since 1989, promoted as a feature of the region's religious heritage, cultural identity, and unique therapeutic offerings. One way to resolve the paradox of Russia's state ambivalent endorsement of traditional medicine is to read it cynically. Non-biomedical treatment is cheaper, especially when it comes to investing in medical infrastructures in remote regions. This is no doubt part of the answer as to why Burat medicine was receiving greater visibility. However, this misses what makes non-biomedical epistemologies of interest to Russia's central bureaucracies in the first place, as well as the role these practices play in regional politics and everyday patients' lives. One of the underlying arguments of the book is that Russian medical state building remains tied to its socialist past. Soviet medicine and Soviet modernity more broadly was riddled with tensions as it tried to articulate, its, articulate itself on the new historical path of development. It defined itself simultaneously against the diverse therapeutic traditions of the indigenous people that it tried to incorporate into the Soviet project, while also seeking to distinguish itself from Western bourgeois medicine. As the Russian state seeks to reimagine a new future for itself away from the West, but also from its socialist past, it appears to have returned to and again become ensconced in the tensions of medical integration, attracted to Burat and other traditions as a way to express a uniquely inclusive post socialist future that foregrounds the cultural and ethnic diversity of the country, but nonetheless insisting on a fully unified, uniformed Russia. That said, the book is not exclusively focused on the contradictory goals and ideologies of the Russian state's efforts to frame itself as a place apart from others. At a moment when, fully coherent, when, a, when a fully coherent vision of the moder uh, future modern medical Russian state has yet to cohere in Moscow, my goal with this book was to re-theorize how people inhabit and make use of therapeutic margins broadly conceived while rethinking anthropology's discussions of encounters between biomedicine and traditional healing. Anthropology has a long tradition of engaging with therapeutic diversity. Arguably, it is one of the foundational pillars of the discipline. But as biomedicine became increasingly global, many of our explanatory models have shifted towards tracking the workings of global health, along with people's active rejections of or pursuits of biomedical care. The effect is to posit biomedicine as the unquestioned center of gravity in people's therapeutic lives. In Russia, as elsewhere, both scholarly and popular writers suggest that patients pursue traditional medicine in one of two cases, either because conventional care has failed them or because it is part of their pre-existing cultural identification. 
Conversely, when framed in the language of non-compliance, as with the avoidance of vaccination, therapeutic paths, paths that shirk conventional care tend to be interpreted as misguided in subordination to public health recommendations. In mixing medicines, I try to complicate these implicit centrifugal models that describe the relationship between, the relationship between official and unofficial medicines. I appreciate anthropology's attention to the epistemic violence that often characterizes the friction between globally circulating biomedical regimes and local therapeutic practices, as well as the discipline's careful excavation of how such frictions reenact colonial legacies. However, one empirical finding of my research is that in Russia, such an approach overestimates the authority of biomedicine and reifies what counts as biomedicine in the first place. Furthermore, equating the tail, tail end of exhausted medical options with forms of care described as traditional risks playing into the long history of the Soviet and post-Soviet states' efforts to often violently modernize its ethnic minorities. It simply leaves little room for thinking about the pursuits of non-biomedical treatments positively, propelled by more than discontent, political resistance, or consumer appetites, but rather as a movement towards something else. Mixing medicines, track, medicines tracks how, in Russia, encounters between state-endorsed medicine and indigenous therapeutic traditions end up reshaping official models of care. The book pivots around two sets of conjoined arguments. First, I argue that Tibetan medicine and other medical traditions in Buryatia are deployed for fashioning an alternative therapeutic imaginary, one in which Siberia becomes both a center and a cosmopolitan crossroads by challenging the spatial orderings implicit in the Moscow-fixated Russian state. Second, the book shows that rather than a last resort response to abandonment and so social marginalization, Experiments with medical integration in Buryatia reflect local people's articulations of new kinds of human and non-human relations. Medical integration is not just about patching holes within biomedicine, but a way of fashioning new possibilities through newfangled relations with plants, spirits, landscapes, memories, and forgotten cultural meanings. But it, also, it is also a terrain of contestation. In Buryatia, experiments with integrative approaches to medicine reframe all ways of being and knowing as always coming from somewhere and thus strive to put them on equal footing. They also invite us to think about how making something cohere is an arduous and uncertain process. By claiming Tibetan medicine as inalienably Buddhist, yet key to restoring the health of Russia's body politic, local act actors refashion the state's forays into therapeutic pluralism to articulate the region's central place in space and history and renegotiate the terms through which disparate therapies are assembled and held in place. In the remainder of the stock, I want to focus on several vignettes that might help illustrate some of the dynamics I seek to outline in the book. And I'll begin with a question that haunted my research because it serves to situate the politics that underpin the frictions and sutures of the projects of that medical integration in Buryatia. Where does modern medicine come from? The question was first posed to me by Sergei, one of the radiophysicists who worked on developing an electronic pulsometer based on Tibetan pulse diagnosis, a project initiated in the Bodhat Sciences Center in the 1980s and carried out to this day. Sergei and I sat on a bench outside the university building where he worked, and as, attempt, as, a, as I attempted to interview him about the goals of his research and about his participation in the project of integrating Tibetan medicine into clinical and laboratory practice, he matched every questions, a, a question I posed with his own. The interaction was awkward. Turning the questions back on me, Sergei demanded an exegesis on the history of medical science. His provocation, which I first mistook for the physicist's penchant for a Socratic method of communication or for skepticism about a US-based researcher's intellectual credentials, slowly came to reshape my own questions. Sergei's answer was unique to him. At my fumbling response, he traced the genealogy of what he called, quote, scientific medicine, unquote, to 19th century European military expansion, the discovery of the anesthetic properties of chloroform, and the development of field surgery. Tellingly, this question was not unique. As I sought to grasp what my interlocutors in Buryatia thought of the Russian state's efforts to formalize the region's therapeutic traditions, I was repeatedly asked in turn what I meant when I invoked biomedicine. The term integratze, a Russian calc of integration, was a popular shorthand to describe what a number of medical institutions and proponents in the healthcare administration and professional medical communities were attempting to achieve. As I discussed elsewhere in the book, 
It figured prominently in the discourses and goals of a relatively recent medical field labeled restorative medicine that aims to restore the health of the nation through non-invasive natural medical technologies, natural medical technologies. In Buryatia and in Russia more broadly, Integratia map, maps onto long-standing but fraught national discourses about the countries and recursively the region's cultural uniqueness as a place of transition and translation between the cultures and history of, quote, East and West. Here I outline the ways in which post-socialist politics of medical knowledge in Siberia might illuminate the dynamics of tradition, global discourses on traditional medicine in its relationship to biomedical practices. By paying attention to the semiotic interplay between modern and traditional medicine in Russia, I would like to take Sergei's challenge seriously. Certainly, critical histories of medicine and science more generally show the internal plurality of biomedical knowledge and practices, tracking their conceptual transformations, dead ends, and internal polyvalence, fr frequently forgotten in a posteriori narratives on, of unidirectional scientific progress. For biomedicine to be recognizably operating at a global scale, albeit as anthropologists have often noted with different local act actualizations and entanglements, as well as teeming with translational innovation, um, springing from the interst interstices of therapeutic encounters, it must constant constantly mask the particularities and origin points of its practices. The stability of biomedicine as, as a discrete object but also its implied efficacies in producing and disciplining subjects rely on the constant normalization of its claims to truth. I take normalization in its double meaning here, in the sense of appealing as the default form of knowledge about collective and individual bodies, and in the sense of being made regular and consistent by obfuscating its internal variation and variations and contradictions. Sergei's question pushes these classic anthropological insights that biomedicine too is multiple in a slightly different analytical direction. It seems to suggest that while all of its, uh, while all of its varied yet recognizable incarnations retain a connection to a stable form, apprehension of its many avatars as always manifesting a recognizable totality, however fractured, allows us to speak of therapeutic practices that fall outside of biomedicine's realm as if such lines of distinctions were something one would be able to identify without much discussion. In contexts where tracing boundaries between different kinds of medicines is never divorced from questions of how things travel and how they are made to settle, descriptions of therapeutic encounters between biomedicine and non-biomedical modalities tend to imply, for the sake of drawing the analytical contrast, a consensus about what biomedicine is. It was this consensus that Gay was establishing on new, fraught, and what to me had felt like socially antagonistic grounds. Not so much that there was a biomedicine, but that we could agree or agree not to argue about what we thought it was. It is in the sense that the term official medicine as a local gloss for biomedicine in Russia seems especially productive. In Russian, at least, official offers more than unquestioned recognition. It implies a kind of double speak that brings into the frame its constitutive outside. Accounts of Soviet science and medicine are sometimes haunted by Cold War legacies. In excavating the uniqueness of Soviet knowledge projects, broadly, broadly speaking, it becomes remarkably difficult not to decenter their authority or claims to truth by invoking Soviet political ideologies and institutional configurations as the determining factor for the ways in which they came to be. Conversely, conflations between, on the one hand, a history of Soviet and Russian therapeutic practices and ideologies, and on the other hand, of Western or European North American approaches to both biomedicine and traditional medicine, miss the subtle and not so subtle differences. So if following Latour, purification is always an important, although never perfectly realized process through which modern scientific knowledge is co-constituted vis-a-vis those practices it excludes, then what happens when an acknowledged hybridity stands at the crux of what it means to achieve medical and scientific progress? These dynamics in Russia displace the expected locus of tension between a global circulating authoritative biomedical discourse and local understandings of bodies and health. In fact, the oppositions between global and local, as well as between traditional medicine and biomedicine, become analytically limiting in a therapeutic context where the questions of scales, 
point of our origin and the nature of medical efficacies and adequate, inadequate care are constantly worried. Other scholars have noted that Soviet notions of progress had silenced a variety of actors in the name of, modern, of a modernist project of rapid technological and social development founded on scientific rationality, a project, moreover, that was understood as simultaneously universal yet uniquely manifested. For its part, as I outline in the book, Soviet engagement with what was labeled Eastern medicine in general and Tibetan medicine in particular were integral to claims of what, about what it means to practice, practice medicine as a scientific discipline and offered a contrast set on which articulating a programmatic relationship between medicine and the modern state became possible. If, as historian Susan Buckmore has suggested, the Soviet project's aspirations to its own version of cosmopolitan universalism was centered on intervening into a dialectical unfolding of time, then leaving the medicines of the past in the past in the hands of appropriate experts, such as historians and ethnographers, offered a way to adjust the Soviet Union to a vision of medicine's universal yet explicitly European history. The resurgence of once silenced modes of healing as audible, tractable, and manageable agents under late socialism and in a post-socialist moment is as much a resignification of political histories as a ground on which Soviet ideologies of health were being remapped and reconfigured in the present, shifting the goalposts of what might count as universal and what counts as particular. We might therefore ask, along with Sergei, who's universal and who's particular? The ethnographic moments that follow look at the ways in which the relationship between the modern and traditional medicine is formulated, different sites that bring these complex and contradictory states to the, um, to the surface. The, the next section is uh, titled, Like Crossbreeding a Hedgehog with an Adder. The office of Bayar Badmaevich was located on the second floor of the East-West Polyclinic one of the four offices with practitioners who identify their specialty with Tibetan medicine resided in the space of integrative medicine. He shared the space with several other doctors since there was a shortage of available rooms for receiving patients. The office is used for massage at times when none of the doctors needed, during lunch hours, for example. Inside, it would look like any biomedical space with its large desk and patient couch, its white curtains and hygienic paraphernalia, if not for the large Buddhist Sangha reproduction of Yutokpa the Younger, an important spiritual figure of worship in the more esoteric aspects of Tibetan medical practice. Bayar Batmayevich himself wore the white frock typical of biomedical doctors in Russia, as did all the other members of the medical personnel of the center. The obligatory white gown worn by practitioners and the blue plastic slippers that patients were asked to don over their shoes or, um, upon entering the vestibule signal the center's clinical identity. The plaque outside of Bayar Badmayevich's office described him as a, quote, therapist, fighter therapist, and Buratia's recognized medical professional, an honorary title bestowed on those medical, uh, medical practitioners who have been in the field for a long time and have actively pursued medical research. In many ways, his self-presentation was fairly typical of what I had come to expect of Buryat medical uh, Buryat doctors I had, uh, that I had met over the years. Mostly soft-spoken, at times brusquely direct, and uproariously funny with his patients. He was primarily known to his patients and his colleagues at, this, at the center as, quote, a Tibetologist, a somewhat misleading des uh, designation of a practitioner of Tibetan medicine used in Buryati interchangeably as a synonym, a synonym for MG. Bayar Badmayevich's patients, frequently older Buryat women, waited for their turn. They came one after another, sometimes accompanied by a family member, sometimes asking for medical advice, not just for themselves, but for their neighbors and friends. He examined the pulse in silence. His gaze turned away from the patient and toward the window, feeling for the textures of pulsation first in one hand, then the other, then examined the patient's tongue. He asked no questions. The patients volunteered the information herself painstakingly listing an array of diffuse symptoms, aches, pains, wheezes, betraying an assiduous scrutiny of her interiority. He joked, diffusing the gravity of a patient's narrative, each manifestation of the body already a potential sign of life-threatening failure, and a recast in the terms so typical of Tibetan medicine, of a body in constant flux. Your wind has gone up, and it's making your phlegm come out of balance. I'll give you something to warm you up, to calm the wind, and the phlegm should settle. 
Aside from immediate, the, the immediate clinical encounter with the patient happening behind closed doors, Tibetan medicine made few appearances in Bayar Badmayevich's practice, despite the fact that this was indeed the specialty for which he was best known. For most Amchi who worked at East-West, this was one of the difficulties of practicing Tibetan medicine in a state-sanctioned integrative clinical setting. Since there was no official recognition for Tibetan medicine under Russian legislation, though other forms of traditional medicine are ratified into law, and since the East-West Medical Center operated under the administrative supervision of Buryatia's Ministry of Health, all diagnosis had to be recorded in an administrative leg uh, administratively legible language. In the center's reports to the Regional Ministry of Health Protection, patients' conditions were formulated in a generic repertoire of biomedicine, and available treatment were almost exclusively reported in accordance with the categories of Russia's healthcare legislation. As a result, Tibetan medicine was reclassified as phytotherapy. Meanwhile, the specificity of Tibetan medicine with its particular approach to illness and the making of medicines was curiously invisible, despite the fact that by reading between the lines of the center's official reports, it became clear that practitioners of Tibetan uh, medicine taken together were responsible for the biggest part of the center's revenue and treated the highest number of patients. For doctors like Vayar Badmayevich, the administrative invisibility of their specialty was a source of irritation. He often expressed annoy annoyance at the necessity to identify himself as a phytotherapist, the closest official gloss for Tibetan medicine practitioners, based on the fact that he relied on the prescription of mostly botanical formulas in his treatments. As he explained, the quote, the theories are completely different. Phytotherapy is really Western medicine. For his part, Bayar Badmayevich argued that the East-West Medical Center as a medical site ought to emphasize traditional medicine over European medicine. The center's administration, on the other hand, had a different vision of the institution's role. For the center's head doctor, administrative legibility was crucial to the center's con continued existence as specifically a state medical institution. Therefore, East West had no position, uh, had to position itself primarily as a site of rehabilitative care. As such, um, the head doctor she, uh, saw, uh, saw the, the clinic as a medical project where integrative approaches that offered a combination of quote, regular and good quality European medicine, end quote, techniques of traditional medicine were put to the service of rehabilitative and restorative medical practice. And it also gave the MT a kind of administrative cover and allowed them to fly under the legislative radar. When I asked Bayar Badmayevich how he envisioned this fusion of traditional and European medicine or Tibetan European medicine, he laughed. It is like trying to crossbreed a hedgehog with an adder. You get something unseemly. The English translation does not do justice to the original pithiness of the comments. In Russian, uzh, ad, ad adder, and yosh, hedgehog, sound remarkably similar until they are forcibly combined. One may question then what species of new unseemliness are engendered by the breeding of different forms of therapeutic knowledge and expertise co present in a space like East West. In practice, it may be difficult to define what makes the center a space of integration, other than the administration's claims that it is. To complicate matters further, doctors and staff used a shorthand to classify traditional therapeutic modalities practiced at the center in terms of their relative easternness and westernness. In other words, although the legislative distinction remains along the lines of modern and traditional medicine, in practice, there are separate gradients of differentiation along which therapeutic approaches might be, uh, might be categorized. For example, both phytotherapy and homeopathy might be traditional, but they're posited explicitly as Western knowledge systems, informed by logics that, from the point of view of Tibetan medicine practitioners, share a fundamental kinship with biomedicine. Even acupuncture becomes divided into its Western and Eastern interpretations. Russian reflexotherapy, which includes but is not limited to acupuncture, is taught in the neurology departments of medical universities, and it has, become, it has been regulated since the late 1970s. Reflexotherapy is officially recognized as an additional professional specialization for neurologists and tra uh, traumatologists in Russia. 
but Eastern acupuncture, it is, as it is locally called, is viewed, viewed as a more direct import from China and Mongolia, and doctors I spoke with describe it as the less westernized approach. Similarly, the pharmacological principles of Tibetan medicine rely on the ability of plant-derived medicinal substances to affect the three constitutions. And practitioners combine the materia medica in such ways as to re regulate the nyepa or culprits. Yet traditional Russian or Western phytotherapy is based on composing botanical mixtures in such a way that each ingredient is matched to a specific condition or phy phys physiological system such as the digestive tract, the cardiovascular system, or the nervous system. This approach within Russian phytotherapy allows practitioners of Tibetan medicine to identify it as quintessentially belonging to biomedical practices, despite its official classification as traditional, on the principle that biomedicine was based on a symptom is based on symptom active ingredient pairings. According to a logic of root causes, focusing primarily on both symptoms and bodily systems elides the underlying working of the nyepa or culprits and the ways in which different organs are made to relate and influence each other. The most typical example I heard of this apparent short-sightedness attributed to modern medicine is the treatment of ear disorders by acting only on the ear itself without checking first on the kidneys, which in Tibetan medicine ha have a direct connection to hearing. In other words, while both Tibetan medicine experts and phytotherapists use botanical substances, practitioners of Tibetan medicine in Buryatia critique phytotherapy's focus on symptoms and its failure to address the root cause of the illness, much in the same way that they critique biomedicine. More pragmatically, for an amchi, a pairing between specific botanicals and anatomical diseases, ca disease categories and biomedical terms ignored the ways in which different ingredients combine and interact. And the next section is called, That's Why Integration Fails. In this section, I shift to an external critique of the institutionalization of Amchi medicine in Buryatia, formulated by those practitioners who find themselves at the peripheries of the official medical establishment. In my first conversation with Erdan Lama, an Amchi working at one of the local Buddhist temples, I asked him how ideas about illness and health in European medicine differ from those in Amchi medicine. Uh, quite classical, naive anthropolog anthropologist in the field question, right? Unlike European medicine, he explained, Buddhist medicine understood that all illness had, if reduced to their phenomenological foundations, a single root cause, namely ignorance, or nivedenya in Russian. Confused by whether he meant ignorance in a more secular sense, or whether he was offering a felicitous homophonic Russian gloss of the Sanskrit avidya, or delusion, an important Buddhist concept, I asked him to explain. After a period of mildly irritated reflection at my obtuseness, Erdan Lama finally volunteered the following example. If a person doesn't know how to live, they get sick, which is why we have to begin with enlightening our consciousness and only then move on to the body. Think about it. Conventional medicine claims that must one must temper the body, dress according to the weather, take contrasting showers, this is all wrong, erroneous, mistaken. This is why it's always a failure when they try to study our medicine from the scientific point of view. We always present European medicine as anti-scientific. Why? Because how do they even think this up, that you should temper the body? We're not made of steel, that we need tempering. And it's, and it's taken chronic illness, it's wrong too. There are no chronic illnesses, only doctors who don't know how to cure. That's why integration fails. In order to incorporate amchi medicine, you have to throw away your preconceptions. In this response, Erdan Lama cleverly combined a Buddhist critique of European forms of medical knowledge, invoking the failures to cure illness and those recalcitrant chronic cases that frequently result in patients in Russia falling through the cracks of official health care, with a rejection of a specific health practice and ideology particular to both official Russian and Soviet medicine, namely Zakalivanya or temporary. In order to understand the strange equation, by all accounts, tempering is certainly not at the center of the practices of mainstream biomedicine in Russia, it is useful to briefly consider its history and position in present day discourses on health. According to the great Soviet encyclopedia, tempering is defined as, quote, a system of procedures that contribute to the organism's capacity to resist the nefarious effects of the external milieu through the production of conditioned reflexes of thermal regulation with the purpose of its improvement. 
A surface reading of tempering suggests a model of the human body as a relatively malleable 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 excuse me substance that can be strengthened and qualitatively transformed through a specific set of bodily techniques namely exposures to the environment tempering was a widespread form of bodily self-management that gained popularity in the soviet union and still is invoked by many people to this day as part and parcel of quotidian practices associated with healthy living or at least is formulated as an ideal of healthy living towards which one might strive in discourses on tempering, it is especially the child's body that it becomes the focal point of regulatory interventions as advocates of the practice emphasize the need to activate the latent capacity of the infant and of the human as a life form more broadly to withstand a harsh environment, a capacity progressively lost over time through excessive efforts to maximally optimize external conditions. The logic of tempering has a long and complex history in Russia and is not unproblematically tethered to exclu exclusively Soviet bodily ideologies. Although it does resonate with other Soviet scientific practices that strove to develop a philosophy of human health. As a concept though, tempering also moves beyond the manipulation of strictly human bodies to encompass other living organisms like plants. For his part, Erdan Lama grounded tempering in the history of the Soviet state shift, shifting health, uh, health ideologies. In his own medical practice, he related Russia's much discussed demographic crisis to what he described as an epidemic of infertility among young women, caused in his opinion by the logics and practices of environmental independence. And while Russian biomedical, biomedicine had a long and robust tradition of thinking about the environmental aspects of health, Abdel Lama's critique runs deeper than the simple rejection of a somewhat cliched Soviet medical utopia about impervious bodies operating at the margins of the possible. I take his equation between what he calls European, with Soviet medicine, and tempering as an effort to articulate a theoretical level abstraction about biomedical knowledge practices in general. Like many other traditional healers in Buryatia, Erdan Lama was engaged in the politics of weirding biomedicine by localizing it. In Sovietizing what he called European medicine, through an invocation of tempering, Erdan Lama's critique rejects claims to universal human bodies or a single universal way of managing them. Okay, I'll skip ahead a little bit because otherwise I'll run out of time. In this final vignette, I seek to bring the debates about medical integration full circle and thread them with a the broader national politics of traditional medicine in Russia. In 2010, I sat in the public relations office of the East-West Polyclinic, helping the three other active members of the organization committee with a rushed preparation for an international conference on the integration of traditional medicine. Ala, the center's lawyer, Lisa, the PR representative, and Ayuna, a pediatrician by profession who as a junior doctor shouldered many of the organizational and logistical tasks associated with the conference, sat at their desks furiously composing programs and pamphlets, responding to emails and phone calls as they tried to balance the influx and contradictory directives coming from the administration with the demands and qu uh, queries of the potential guests. The atmosphere was rushed and tense, the anxieties and frustrations elicited by the approaching deadline diffused by an unceasing stream of teasing, wisecracks and all seemingly inexhaustible supply of ribald humor, which would vanish without a trace in her flawless, flawlessly professional telephone voice, only to resume as soon as the phone call was over. The phone rang incessantly and the other office dwellers largely ignored Alice's conversations until the habitual, the habitual routine was broken by Alice's unusual tone a thin veneer of officiousness over barely contained amusement. Between the long pa pauses, she proceeded to patiently explain to her invisible interlocutor what medical services the East-West Center provided. When she finally hung up, she turned to us and recounted the conversation, chuckling at its apparent linguistic absurdity. Someone had called to inquire whether the services, uh, services East-West offered under the label of traditional medicine were really non-traditional or unconventional medicine. What's so unconventional about, about us, I wonder, she queried with a flirtatious head bob to the laughter of her colleagues. Where had they called from, Ayuna inquired, still chuckling and repeating the offending, ter offending term to herself, Ali explained that her interlocutor had called from Moscow, a statement meant with silent nods of understanding from the others. 
The humor of Alice Squip draws attention to the ways in which tradition becomes an especially latent term in Borussia, a region already culturally marked as a kind of internal other in national imaginaries that take the Western part of Russia to be the unmarked equivalent of the nation as a whole. Alice's joke highlighted not simply that the term non-traditional, when mobilized to designate therapeutic practices at East-West, is confusing because it brings into focus by association the other use of the term netradizionne in Russia, specifically in the pairing of non-traditional orientations to desig designate LGBTQ identities. More import importantly for the PR team of Buryat women, it pointed to the ways in which being an outsider to the region simultaneously means an ignorance of Russia's cultural and religious ties to a transnational Buddhist world, and more specifically to Buryatia's connection to the realm of global Tibetan medicine, with a failure to recognize the commitment to the development of this local cultural heritage as such, and not as an alternative to a norm. Indeed, as, indeed, as East-West finds itself at the unexpected vanguard of federal level efforts of, at medical integration, buttressed by its ability to garner federal financing, so financial, financial support uh, for development ex and expansion, the center's administration imagines the institution as perfectly reflecting the future of Russia's national policy towards traditional medicine. Yet, in Allah's comment, tradition scales up to articulate claims that are not just about therapeutic strategies, but equally about the relationship to local histories, the place of cultural alterity in Soviet and post-socialist ideologies of progress, and the present-day meaning of recuperating a local past to the benefit of both regional and national bodies. The silent consensus among Ale and her colleagues stemmed from the supposition that all of us understood the clinic's interpretive project as standing in implicit contrast with European medicine, where the latter was as culturally and historically situated as any other therapeutic form. In other words, while European medicine held an important place in the activities of the center, biomedical care was not perceived as unproblematically universal or divorced from its political and historical origins. Claims to non-autochthonous yet deeply rooted therapeutic practices that pre uh, preceded and have pre persevered through the history of Soviet modernization highlight the absence of a pure medical tradition that might be easily associated with an ethnically Russian state or Russian culture more generally. This indeterminacy is in fact at the center of how some experts define what is unique about Russia's case. For example, Russia's Professional Phytotherapy Association claims a long-standing ethnically Russian practice of natural herbal medicine developed into present-day clinical applications. However, these medical practices are described as unique because they were established at the intersection and through the mutual influences between Western and Eastern medical traditions. Such claims appear to recuperate and cite a historically recurrent discourse frequently scaled up to the level of state ideologies and perpetuated by Russian and Soviet intellectuals that identifies Russian culture as a middle way between a, uh, the Asian East and the European West, and put that in quotes, right? However, such claims to national exceptionalism via celebration of hybridity open it up a space of critique. Amchi and Buryatia frequently emphasized the stark differences between traditional and modern medicine, but also contested the boundaries of distinction articulated through an opposition between East and West. One of the implications of those, these oppositions and refusals is that a, quote, traditional Tibetan medicine that is nonetheless specific to Buryatia can be mobilized in a politics of patrimony the Russian state might have access to only by virtue of a serious engagement with Buryatia's cultural, religious, historical, and ethnic specificity. This unique regional configuration is formulated as inherently more syncretic and more global by virtue of Buryatia's culturally equidistant ties to multiple symbolic religious and therapeutic worlds. Conversely, official medicine or biomedicine itself, insofar as it is linked to European medicine, becomes open to critical lo localization and a challenge to its universalist claims. When Amchi like Arden Lama or Bayad Padmaevich question projects of medical integration, or when Ala describes her Muscovite interlocutors insistent on the unconventional status of her workplace, or when Sergei challenges the US-based ethnographer about medical historiographies, it is precisely because an official medicine that mistakes itself for a human universal is blind to its own rootedness and to its trajectories of travel, and blind to the very processes that have officiated it 
and thus offers no adequate terrain on which integration in either medical or political grounds might be imagined as a desirable future. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana, for this uh, really fascinating talk and also a fascinating book, which I recommend to all the viewers to get. Um, I, I was wondering, before we have questions streaming in, if you could tell us a little bit more maybe about the uh, legislative status across the federal yeah. and regional entities, because I understand that's kind of a complicated matter. It's really complicated. And, and, and I'll try to summarize it um, and try not to bore you too much with it. So most of um, Russian regulation of healthcare is in Article 50 um, of uh, the Russian Constitution. And it's, uh, sorry, uh, yes. So, and it, essentially what it does is it legitimizes traditional medicine or it, it has this category of traditional medicine, um, which is in some senses opposed to um, biomedicine, which is never sort of very clearly defined. But um, what counts as traditional medicine is quite, um, quite contested, right? So it includes things like traditional medical systems without really defining what those traditional medical systems are. It also includes something called folk, folk medicine without necessarily specifying um, who counts as folk, right? Um, for the purposes of Tibetan medicine, it is not technically legal, right? At least it wasn't when I was doing fieldwork in Russia. It's not, it does not fall under this legislative um, kind of apparatus. However, um, kind of regulating um, local therapeutic pluralisms, right, is outsourced. So the federal government sort of gives this blanket um, blanket definition, but outsources the specific licensing and regulation to the regions. So at that level, there can be some decisions uh, about who counts as um, kind of a, a traditional healer, who, can, who doesn't count as a traditional healer, who is licensed to practice, who isn't. Um, but that regulation then does not scale back up, right? So like that, it, it, it works at the regional level, but doesn't necessarily um, kind of retroactively legitimize the practice at the federal level. So as a kind of result of that, there's also an interesting division between religious healing and traditional medicine. And religious healing is actually regulated by entirely different codex. It's uh, regulated by the Russian labor co codex. And it's in this weird category um, that also includes things like dog sitting and escort services, et cetera. So that's like what's called tzeditilt in Russian is regulated again by a different uh, kind of legal structure. So the so kind of the fallout of that is that technically an Amchi could practice Tibetan medicine, but not as labor, right? But not as a form of labor, or could practice like charismatic healing or religious healing, but not as medicine. So this is a bit of a bind, right? Um, and so what effectively happens is that an Amchi needs what a practitioner, of, a practitioner of Tibetan medicine needs a cover. And it's talked about, in Russia, it's talked about in terms of krusha, if you know the term. So like a kind of like, which comes, which has a kind of history of um, coming out of the 1990s, right? A history of sort of criminal structures providing protection, right? For various businesses and whatnot, not necessarily just criminal, right? So they need this krusha, they need this cover which can take different forms, right? And sometimes, and it depends on, you know, a lot of, a lot of this depends on, uh, depends on the AMG's particular, you know, strategies that might be something, you know, ranging from practicing in something that like the, you know, either East-West clinic, the integrative medicine, which, in which case they cannot label themselves officially as, as AMG, right? Or practicing in the sort of private sphere, uh, in a state of deep vulnerability to um, deep legal vulnerability, in which case one strategy would be to take on um, kind of prominent or politically influential or wealthy clients or patients, because, you know, a timely phone call can get you out of hot water. And different people kind of negotiate this in different ways, depending on like kind of how they organize the la their labor. But that's really 
Um, that's kind of really the conund- one of the conundrums it, be, be, you know, behind what's happening. At the same time, um, I mean, East West, the, the clinic I call East West, that's of course not the, the, the real title name of it, um, has received quite a bit of um, federal financing for specifically implementing integrative medicine, um, including Buddha traditional forms of tra- traditional forms of Buddha, you know, therapy, which of course everybody knows includes the kind of Buddha Tibetan medicine. So legally, this is um, this is really complex and kind of creates the sort of subject positions for people that are not so easily or transparently ne- negotiated, right? So that's kind of what I want, you know, and that's not really part of, you know, of the talk, but thank you for bringing it, bringing it up. I was also wondering about the uh, the people who use this medicine. I mean, there's, there's going to be people who are believers who really are Buddhist, but I imagine there will also be people who are looking for alternative medicine and who are not necessarily uh, in for the, the, the religious aspect of it. Am I, am I right? Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, my my sense of it, I mean, there, there's absolutely people who only use it because they're Buddhist, right? Who do not use biomedicine at all, right? Like they are just, um, and that's not, that does not necessarily follow along ethnic lines, right? Like that could be Russians or um, Buddhist or others, right? Who, um, I mean, this is a quite um, diverse, um, you know, republic in ter- terms of the population. So, you know, that, Kind of the, the the ethnic distinctions are not necessarily predictors of, of of use. That being said, so yes, that's definitely there. But that being said, I think the kind of like belief versus not belief and or belief versus consumerism, right, is not really a such a salient category. Um, I mean, look, a lot of people just kind of use all sorts of, you know, people have recourse to all sorts of avenues, and so. Um, many will use things in conjunction, right? So, um, um, you know, many people will, may, many patients will use things in conjunction. So they might go through a biomedical kind of standard biomedical, conventional biomedical treatment. And then um, wh- whether that works or not, it, either in parallel or not, might be also having, you know, having recourse to um, Tibetan medicine. And other, right? Like I don't talk about shamanism, but that's another kind of element of all of this. Um, so there's a kind of there's a kind of very effervescent movement of patients between different practitioners, and they also don't equate. Um, I'm cheap practitioner, like not not all practitioners are equivalent, right? So people are very kind of discerning about which practitioner uh, they want to, you know, they, they will kind of have a relationship with and and have the you know um, go to and trust, uh, you know sort of their treatment and um you know depending depending on all kinds of factors so it's not so much so these divisions divisions are not stark right it's more kind of an interesting circulation of both patients and practitioners through this um you know what i call therapeutic ecology as it were right so it's not um it's not so it's not boxed in and those and those boundaries too right like those boundaries between traditional medicine and uh, and this is part of what I'm trying to do in the book and part of what I was trying to do uh, in the talk, right? Traditional medicine and uh, official medicine, conventional medicine, whatever you want to call it, right? Like they, they, they really the no- nomenclature proliferates and pe- people as, a, as sort of like amusedly wrangling with it as I am, right? Um, <coughs> are not so distinct. They're not so stark either, right? So people kind of move laterally across different things that we might think of as boundaries and really aren't. All that much in practice at the same time as boundary work is constantly of course being done mm-hmm. yeah this is something i've also i've seen in, in the context of mongolia with uh also did a bit of research on, on the, the kind of medicine that people have access to and what they they go for and yeah it's, it, there's definitely a, a mixture for certain things for certain ailments you know yeah. that would be the traditional medicine for other things but it's probably the same in the west right it's probably the same thing that we see in america and, and europe i mean without generalizing there's also um aspects of tra- non you know uh, kind of what is seen as traditional more um you know, different types of medicine especially maybe to treat like things like covid people will try to you know 
use different alternatives. I don't know whether that's something you, you've seen also in, in recent years in Boyatia, but I don't know whether you followed the... Uh, specifically with COVID, unfortunately, no. So I haven't been able to, uh, to go back to the field um, mm -hmm. since the pandemic hit, right? Um, and I hope to, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, there is There was definitely a lot of kind of talk around um again you know i really I, the, the, this kind of division between alternative conventional and alternative is not doesn't really work in the russian context and i bet it doesn't really work in the mongolian context in the, in the context of mongolia either at least it doesn't work in Buryatia very well it, 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 it might be it might work in moscow to some extent Part, partly because um there is so much unsettling of this, like the kind of power gradient of the implied conventional alternative, right? That's in, built into that kind of nomenclature. Um, so the, they were, I mean, the, the, the one thing I can sort of give an example of specifically in relation to infectious diseases is one that swine flu hit the region. Um, so in 2009, um, you know, and certain kinds of, ant, uh, you know, antiviral medicines that are theoretically, like technically normally available, like Abidol, right? Um, uh, Menifinovir uh, are available, you know, we're, we're just sw swept off the shelves. Um, the practitioners of Tibetan medicine I spoke with um, were, were sort of saying something similar. They were saying, you know, um, Manushitan, which is one of the formulas that they use for um, uh, sort of upper respiratory effect, uh, infections that's really, really popular, right? Um, like everybody wanted them, right, <laughs> at the moment. So, you know, so again, it's not, and it's, I don't think it's because like, oh, we don't, you know, oh, we should try an alternative treatment. Uh, like people there, that they know this is a resource they have, right, that, 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 that exists. They, so, of course, you might go and get Arbidol from the pharmacy, but you're also going to go get Manusha down from, you know, like a local MG, right, because, you know, the more the merry. <laughs> so, so, again, I don't think those distinctions are, you know, there's like the political debates, which is more sort of what my talk focused on around like all the nomenclature and how people's positionality, right? But there's also kind of the patients um, circulating in all kinds of, kinds of ways and uh, enjoying on all kinds of uh, practices, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to raise some, some of the questions we received. I don't know whether Marisa, you have any questions you want to ask first or whether we should. Oh, um, I, I was going to say that actually the first question in the question and answers right along what I wanted to ask. So we should just- Did you wanna relay that? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, switching a bit, I think from like the, the humans to the to the non-humans or the substances or something. Um, Carol is asking us, um, asking you um, about the botanical sources. Are they locally grown in Briatia or there is there also yeah. some trade involved, right? So that also gets to the kind of commercialization or not. Yeah. It's really, that's a great question. And actually the book is a lot about that, right? So I'm sorry I can't like touch it on, you know, on this in, in this short talk, but um, you know, it's, I, I talk a lot about this. So um, it's a mixture and it's a mixture. I mean, so a lot of local amchi definitely source locally. It's a lot of, you know, a lot of the medicines or the, the, the plants that go into uh, formulas are wild crafted in the region. Um, there is some stuff that's um, so, but, but the thing is, you can't actually put together um, sort of the, the, the Tibetan pharmaceutical formulas. The, I should say Buryat because they are Buryat, right? Like they have been adapted since the 19th century. A lot of the labor that the sort of early phase of, um, you know, 18th, 19th century uh adaptation of Tibetan medicine to Buryatia is all about substituting um, unavailable flora and other unavailable ingredients with local endemics, right? Because, you know, you, you, a lot of, you know, a lot of the kind of formularies are based on stuff that just doesn't grow in the region. It's a very, very different climate, right? It's old, et cetera, et cetera. Now that being said, so people do wildcraft a lot. Um, there's in fact now a lot of um, issues with this because um, uh, my colleague 
at Cambridge is sort of now working on this project, but uh, looking at um, a kind of bio bio prospecting on the part of uh, you know, and and Marisa probably can also attest to this, right? We were there for the same workshop, but bio prospecting uh, by Chinese pharmaceutical firms that are sort of you know, collecting or by proxy collecting a lot of um, local res medicinal resources uh, or medicinal medicinal plants. But yeah, people people wildcraft people get some stuff. Umti gets some stuff from um, from elsewhere, mostly from Mongolia. Um, sort of bulk, small scale bulk purchasing, <laughs> right? Um, but crossing the border is a perilous proposition in many ways, especially if you're trying to import botanicals. And so it, it, it also involves the sort of cultivate, cultivation and informal networks with you know, potential trustworthy suppliers. You also want the, 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 the plants um, that you're using for formulas, right? It's life or death. You actually want to make sure that those plants are um, a efficacious, B not you know grown in a way that um, you know they they haven't accumulated heavy metals, for example, right? Like so, there's all kinds of considerations in terms of that. But a lot of that labor, which really constitutes a huge part of what Amchi do on a day to day basis, right? So they only charge for medicines; they don't charge for diagnosis. So really, that's the only commodity that gets exchanged, uh, that gets traded in this sort of like encounter, right? Um, a lot of the labor that um, Chi do, local um, Chi kind of practice, is making medicines, right? It's 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 kind of from harvesting to you know or collecting to and not over collecting because you have this particular relationships with local places and if you over harvest, then you know then you might have troubles keeping up your practice down the line, right? And there's all kinds of competitors, you know, on um, especially on rare. Um, you know, as far as rare plants are concerned. So, uh, you know, so you kind of, they, they, a lot of what they do, right? It, it, like all they're doing is do, making these medicines, right? So it's, and it's, it's all handcrafted. A lot of this is handcrafted, at least for kind of personal practice, the, the Amchi who are, who are involved in per person practice. East West has its own kind of far, Tibetan, far, well, it's not Tibetan, it's not, but phytopharmacy in which it sells um, kind of formula or, formulas, uh, pharmaceutical formulas based on Tibetan medicine um, or based on Tibetan med medical formulas preparations, right? Um, but there is another level of substitutions because of course the pharmacy is working at a very different level. They're not wild crafting. They're getting resources from all over the place. Um, and they're constricted by Russia's official pharmacopoeia, which doesn't, which is essentially access out a whole lot of um, botanicals that could be that are used in Buryat medicine like you know Tibetan Buryat formulas but are not legal in Russia because they are either endangered or they're considered toxic or all kinds of reasons why not right they haven't been studied um, so they adapt those formulas and then it's not always entirely clear what this like whether those formulas are equivalent a lot of my MTA kind of interlocutors and friends are saying like they're not there's this is a different medicine and we have no clue what it does right once it's been adapted in this way so so i guess yeah so that's kind of begins to answer that question um we have another question um, asking about the concept of tampering and asking whether you could expand on this idea of organisms and their milieu as it was presented in Buddhist and pre-Soviet settings. The process of that. Yeah. See whether you can touch on how individuals such as Ilya Ilyich Mechnikov engaged with Buddhist ideas in the 1880s while developing distinct biochemical notions of organisms' impressionability i.e. theories in soil science of geographical possibilism or determinism. That's kind of a... That is a really interesting question. And I'm afraid I have to, I would have to look in, like more deeply into it. So the stuff I engaged with in the book is Ivanov's um, uh, sort of, so I trace a kind of genealogy of, um, of tempering, right? Um, there's kind of two stories of this relationship 
um, at least how it sort of showed up in the spaces where I was, um, you know, I was, uh, I was gathering, you know, I was, I was working. Once one sort of element of the story is about um, uh, kind of Ivanov's practice practices around, um, yeah, sort of formulation of tempering. And I don't know if you know who Ivanov was. He was a sort of really interesting figure born at the end of the 19th century, if I remember correctly, who developed this philosophy, philosophy of Zakal, Zakalevania, uh, who then, um, and, and had a really complicated relationship to the Soviet state because he was um, kind of repeatedly either incarcerated or committed uh, to a psychiatric asylum with a diagnosis of schizophrenia quite predictably, right? And then he came out and uh, accused of like uh, being an Eastern Orthodox mystic. Um, then, um, you know, or alternatively kind of like charismatic healer. So he kind of went through the cycle of incarceration and, um, and, uh, and yeah, complicated relationship. At the same time, avowedly like, a dedicated Marxist, right? And like dedicated to sort of Soviet um, ideologies, right? Um, and he wrote several works that then got picked up somewhere, like I think in the 70s and 80s. And there was a movement of Ivanovsky, uh, which uh, kind of popularized this, his, not, his notion of Zakalevania. Um, now, it wasn't strictly speaking it sounds like a kind of, it's about, it, you know, it sounds like it's about sort of imperviousness, the body's imperviousness to the environment, but it's quite the opposite um, in a sense, right? It's like, it, it, there is this logic of, yeah, emplacement in the milieu and being able to forestand the milieu. I mean, he's, his whole practice was um, based on, you know, progressively uh, wearing less and less clothes and walking around in the winter right? <laughs> without shoes, you know, and this kind of, this, this sort of thing. So, um, so a lot of the practices that kind of come up as tempering and that Erdan Lama is then uh, sort of highlighting here, he's thinking of, uh, from my conversations with him later, he's really thinking about like sort of the 1980s popularity and mainstream and integration of this tempering into a kind of healthcare mainstream, Soviet healthcare main mainstream. Um, so that's what I think he's sh he was shadow boxing with. On the other hand, there's another kind of discourse about um, kind of the relationship with the environment and that, that, that is in, you know, in Soviet medicine it has a long lineage and I have a sort of chapter on that in the book. Um, but for the, per and, and, you know, via kind of uh, lazarev and adaptogens, um, but, you know, for the purposes of, kind of the argument, um, and I'll think about your question more. I think that's a great point. For the purposes of the argument here, you know, the people who are kind of excavating the Soviet legacies of like specifically Soviet healthcare, you know, and especially when, they, you know, they're, they're kind of identify themselves as MT, they're doing it very, they're doing it very strategically and they're doing it in, you know, in, in such a way that allows them to make a claim about biomedicine, like sort of what counts as med, like as official med, and, and again, I don't want to use, the, using the term biomedicine gets us into another kind of muddle, right? So it's really official medicine, like, so that it allows them to kind of de-officialize, right? What counts as official medicine for, or on the basis of it's sort of like, cultural emplacement, if that makes sense. So yeah, I'll, thank you for the question. I'll, I mean, I'll think about this more. Yeah, I, I think with your last point, that's, I've just been sort of sitting here thinking that I think the way this, the way sort of Buddhist medicine works in Mongolia is actually very different to how it works in Buryatia. Mm. Um, and it does have to do with the relationship to the state and what is actually in structures that are actually like state structures in a modern sense as well. So, yeah. Yeah. I think, and, and I'm not surprised because I think like in some senses, you know, Mongolia, I don't know, you, you tell me if that's the case, but Mongolia has a much better opportunity to nationalize 
right? Uh, something like Tibetan medicine, you know, whether, of course, it will relabel it as Mongolian medicine, right? Um, you know, and of course, it is a little, you know, it is distinct. I mean, you, you can say it's like part of kind of Himalayan medicine more broadly, right? Like if you want to make a, a general kind of claim. But Russia doesn't have that opportunity because it gets it in, gets it in, would get it into all kinds of trouble about, right, who, whose medicine are we going to nationalize, <laughs> right? So again, and of course, like the sort of multinational status or multi-ethnic status is written into the constitution, right? Like Russia is a multinational federation. So again, you have this, the, you see echoes of this wrangling in the legislation, which makes them so kind of, which makes it quite interesting, but also kind of fraught along those lines of like, well, so who, whom do we count, right? Um, so it's interesting. Yeah, the, the contrast is really interesting. So in a sense, like, yeah. Yeah, I think there are some similarities, though, with um, Stacy's question. Um, Stacy Van Fleet is asking us a question as well. So yeah, mm -hmm. she's asking about, um, she was struck by the seemingly uncritical way that your Buryat interlocutors referred to what they practice as, quote, Tibetan medicine. Can you say about, more about the use of this label and whether indeed there is any tension there? There is a lot of tension there. Um, it's in many ways a gloss, right? Um, and you know, Tibetan medicine—it's uh, not that. It's not. A, I see what you. I see what you're saying. I mean, uncritical in the sense that um, it's kind of like a very um, weird ethnic modifier of something that. Um, you know, is uh, is is technically within you know within Buryatia rather than yeah that's the connection to Tibet. Um, it gets complicated. So there are kind of contested stories about when Tibetan medicine arrived and how to Buryatia, right? Um, in many and in many ways, it is a problem of it being a recognizable product, right, on both global and uh, kind of Western Russia markets of what Frank was talking about with sort of alternative medicine, right? Locally, it functions pretty kind of. Yeah, un, to some extent unreflexively, but then there's some, you know, kind of as a linguistic gloss. But then when the rubber hits the road, there are all kinds of debates, in fact, and I talk a little bit about this in my book, about what should we call it, <laughs> right? It's not technically Tibetan, right? It's not, it's actually Buryat, but if we call it Buryat medicine, nobody will know what it is. Right. So, you know, and so, but it's also influenced by all these other traditions. So do we in also incorporate all these other traditions in the label, right? So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of, there are a lot of debates. Um, and then you can't, you know, the other side of it is that some people would, you know, might call it Buddhist medicine, right? Uh, but then that gets into another whole, um, you know, kind of, can of worms uh, with the science, like the research center, right? Which, um, and the sort of activity of the scientists, the local scientists who have been working on this uh, because they would say, well, you know, to what extent, this is not, you know, why do we label this Buddhist, right? Why, why is this not, um, you know, why is it not something else? So kind of, um, or why is it, why is it not um, taken to be, um, another kind of like self-sufficient um, kind of traditional medical system, right? So there's all sorts of politics around it. And so sort of everybody settles on the, well, Tibetan medicine, it seems like the sort of the, the, um, the, 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 the most easily available gloss. Um, where it does get complicated too is when Tibet, actual Tibetans have moved to Buryatia and practice Tibetan medicine as well. And then you have all kinds of conflicts about who is more authentic. Okay, so thank that, you for your question. The mm. fact that they call it Tibetan medicine, I mean, does it have anything to do with the status of Tibet as kind of the, the origin, the place of origin or something that's maybe fantasized about, like it, it could be elsewhere? I think it has to do with a kind of contextualization of the term and the specific history of 
how this medicine uh, developed in this region, but also was um, a target for state repressions during the Soviet period, then got picked up, re-picked up, kind of rediscovered in the 1960s by um, local, right? To something, I mean, the Buryat, um, you know, uh, scholars and um, practitioners. Oh, well, I mean, sorry, uh, not practitioners, scholars and sort of like researchers, right? And then became a kind of who worked on the translational kind of translating the remaining archive of um, uh, Buddhist Siberian Buddhist monasteries or Buryat Buddhist monasteries that were ironically shoved into the Museum of Atheism right, for, for, for a while. And so kind of like this activity of recuperating it um, after a period of um, political, at best invisibility, at worst uh, violence, right? So, so it has this sort of, and then it's sort of how it disseminated because what happened is that um, when this project in the in the sixties, right, started at the Buryat Science Center, um, the head of the project was able to hire a group of Buddhist lamas who had been previously incarcerated in Soviet labor camps and kind of bring them into the fold as you know sco junior scholars, consultants, right, to help with the translational work. And a lot of the then kind of revival of this practice started happening, um, at least, you know, again, this is kind of the story of Lana Day in many ways, started happening around the Islamists, right? And about them taking, it's a lineage, it, it is their lineage system. It's not like, you know, there's no colleges for it, as it were, formal, except against uh, Kia. Yeah, I think in the Ginsk, you can, you can study, but point being, there is a kind of contextualized body of translated works that have called it Tibetan medicine that are in Russian, right? And from there is just, it, that, that, that became known in that way, right? So it's kind of more about like linguistic contextualization in many ways too. But yeah, that's a good question though, too though. Yeah, I, th I think like the difference just kind of to, say something very hy hypothetical and very, very maybe too blunt and I need to continue thinking about it. But I mean, in Mongolia, it seems that, you know, it, it, it operates a space of religion to the extent yeah. that there is Buddhist medicine or healing or whatever, or, you know, things that you learn at the mon at Gondon monastery or yeah. abroad, think... that's, it's religion. And if you actually try yeah. to go into the realm of medicine, you would get, the state would be like, no, it's, would then recategorize it. So, yeah, um, I mean, and I think those boundaries are, I mean, I don't know, maybe in Mongolia as well, in Buretsa, those boundaries are interestingly flexible, but they are definitely moments when they become activated as sites of contestation. Is this religion or is this science, right? Is this like pat cultural pat patrimony or is this, um, or sorry, is it like, you know, is it a sign of like, is it, you know, is it an expression of Tibetan culture, right? That is kind of like a global patrimony or is it specifically Buryat, right? Like, and you know, there's there's lots of kind of moments. There's some moments in the book, like the Atlas, the, the debates around the Atlas of Tibetan medicine and circulation. There's a sort of specific moment about this where there's like, that's definitely a site of conflict, right? How to categorize it and what to, and, and what to do with it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a nice segue maybe to to Stacy's kind of asking if there is competition with with other sort of Tibetan world, Himalayan world type medicines. And this is actually just bringing up for me too. There's currently actually I know some anxiety in the sort of California based Mongolian community about um, like Native American shamans and people going to shamans Ooh. and um really? influencing people to to actually harm themselves um was something i just learned about a few days ago so I'd so i would share say more about that yeah yeah anyway but yeah so stacy's asking for follow-up too you know, i'm also interested about that that's a super interesting question there is competition on like very um uh, 
kind of local terrains, but that like, you know, so there's competition in a sense. You can think about this as competition, but um, in a certain sense, right? Um, between ethnic Tibetans who have come into Buryatia who practice, who might be practicing Tibetan medicine, whether at the temple or in the kind of like interstices, right? Which is what a lot of people do, right? They practice kind of, you know, under the radar of a lot of things. Um, and, and you know, the traditional practitioners in Buryatia do this as well, right? Like, or Buryat practitioners do this as well, and, and Russians when they're practicing it as well. There is a competition, but there's also kind of a sense, at least from the patients, and I think I mentioned this a little bit, that, you know, um, chi are not equivalent. They're not fungible, <laughs> right? Like one um, chi might be really good at, uh, at treating this one kind of thing. And then another um, chi might have, you know, might be really good at treating this other kind of thing. So, and, you know, patients navigate between these, this site very consciously and very strategically, right? So it's, there's definitely kind of debates about legitimacy right legitimacy and authenticity and this question of like who is a, actually an authentic healer and this should be familiar to um Mar marisa your con you know the, the, the mongolian context too and i'm mean, just thinking of um axel Pedersen's work right about like who is authentic like the authenticness of like practitioners which i think it is like a sort of uniquely post-socialist thing right this 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 uh anxiety of our authenticness but, um, you know, and it really, it does bring up a kind of ontological conundrum, like what is, what remains, right? What, you know, what is legitimate? What can be counted as legitimate? What remains of this um, practice um, after it's been driven to the margins, so to speak, right? So, but people don't generally think of themselves as in competition with, other, at least in my experience, this might have changed since I did my field work, right? I don't know. But people don't, don't generally think of themselves as in competition with other um, kind of countries that practice, uh, you know, that, that, that have, um, that use Tibetan medicine or that have legalized it in some ways or formalized it in some ways, right? And if anything, um, they're taken as like really good examples of like, look, but we can't do that, right? Um, so again, depends on what kind of, almost kind of depends on what you mean by competition, right? Um, there is definitely annoyance at uh, kind of clinics in Moscow, and there's a lot of them springing up and claiming Tibetan medicine. Um, you know, there's definitely a kind of like, oh, <laughs> in this sort of very... Uh, you know, and it, also along the lines of authenticity. That's also a critique of authenticity too. Even though sometimes those clinics are run by um, people from Buryatia, right? But nonetheless, there's kind of, they are in Moscow. <laughs> Let's be very clear, right? Um, so, um, so, that, so there's a kind of, there's that sense. There, there are frictions between the temple-based healers, the kind of, and the, and the sort of more formalized medical, you know, uh, sites, but those frictions also are kind of sometimes they flare up and sometimes they um, they subside, right? And they kind of like and people cross those boundaries in fluid ways as well. So again, it sort of almost depends on like when are you looking at it, right? At what moment? So yeah, yeah, you know, it's really fascinating how the you, you said the one MC and another would be very different in terms of their capacity, their skills, their specialization. So it's very um, personal, uh, a personal element right? that you do you don't see in Western medicine, right? I mean, people would not feel the same way. But I mean, there might be like a, a different skills people see maybe like more skillful, but maybe it would be more about technical competence rather than something that's yeah. I think, I mean, I think ultimately we all make these decisions too, right? Like, I mean, it's, you know, we, we I don't think that, 
you know, it's a long tradition and about and like in medical anthropology talking about like the sort of fracturing of biomedicine. It has like, it's not equivalent either, right? It's not all the same thing. It's kind of like the, the feeling that's all the same thing is a kind of an artifact of our own epistemic kind of commitments, right? I've seen, I've seen what doctors write about each other in the EHR systems. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very eye-opening. <laughs> very along many of these lines that Tatiana describes. <laughs> That's wonderful. I don't know, maybe not very wonderful to read all that, that sort of vitriol, right? But um, yeah, so yeah, they're not equivalent. I mean, look, I think the big difference, okay, the, there is one big difference, I think, between the US context and the Russian context. And that's like how much, how much biomedicine is seen as a gravitational force, right? How, how big of a gravitational object it's experienced as. And it's not experienced in the same way as it is in the U.S., right? I, the U.S. has this always sort of it also has all kinds of alternatives, right? And it also, also has all kinds of counter discourses around non-biomedical treatments. But just the kind of confidence, the degree of confidence, right, um, in biomedicine, um, at least in Buryatia, I think is also kind of to a great extent, the case in Russia, more generally, depending on where you are, is not does not give it some, as much primacy, right? So, and it doesn't see it as a kind of like monolith either. So, yeah, does that? I don't know if that really answers the question, but sort of gestures at it. Right. Oh, no, it's, it's it's really interesting. I mean, I yeah, I I, I like the. I mean, I like to think of how your your research can also illuminate certain things that we see closer to home that might seem very different, but there might be some elements. Uh, kind yeah. Of, it helps us see it in a different light. Um, we have yeah. a question asking about the shamans and how does that fit in the picture in Boyatia? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there's, you know, uh, just I can recommend a colleague's work. Uh, Justine Bakuhada has a really wonderful new book on, uh, on precisely this question. So I will defer to her as the expert on, on Buddha shamanism, right? And there's also lots of really fascinating, you know, other fascinating ethnographies in this. Um, I can tell you how I interfaced with, I, I, I went into the field explicitly saying, I'm not going to, like, I don't have the scope to touch on shamanism too, right? To, to kind of deal with shamanism as well. Partly because Tibetan medicine is a textual tradition. And so I had to do all this reading, right? <laughs> it, was, it was just a kind of a strategic decision. That being said, of course, there's no avoiding it which is to say that uh, patients also, depending on their kind of alignments, local alignments and local preferences and kind of their religious commitments as well, um, some are quite fluidly moving between, um, you know, kind of conventional clinical settings, uh, integrative clinical settings, uh, kind of amchi who are more sort of either private private practicing have private practices or temple based and shamans and again it it, it patterns along the sort of like it defends what the problem is <laughs> right um, and there's a kind of itinerary to it there's a really um, fun story that um, one uh, one of my um, kind of friends interlocutors told me about. Um, her husband was uh, an Amchi. He passed away. He was also a translator of the Tibetan medicine, uh, medicine canon, the Tibetan medicine canon, and sort of the, the formularies, especially. He passed away um, some years ago. Um, but uh, when he was still alive, at one point, um, somebody sent, well, some acquaintance in Moscow sent this young woman to them saying she, who had, um, who had clearly, who had undergone a nervous breakdown, right? Um, and there was no helping her uh, with it, with a kind of in, within the system where she was at um, or nothing was helping. And so she, however, whatever, however that network worked, right? So uh, this young woman arrives to Buryatia to visit um, this couple. And um, it sort of turns out that she was practicing 
some kind of yogic breathing technique, uh, you know, and um, just just some something happened, right? And 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 um, it didn't go well. Um, and so this practitioner, this Tibetan medicine practitioner, looked at her, right? Like took her pulse, examined her, and he's like, "I can't do anything for you. You're going to have to go to see a shaman." Right. So, and that is not an uncommon story, right? So, and it's a not an uncommon story for an MT to, under certain conditions, be like, "Look, I probably can't help you, but you might want to try the shamans." Um, yeah. There's some antagonists. I heard about, about, you know, there were sometimes antagonisms um, between, but but they weren't like super on the surface. But again, that might be my own optics because I didn't like actively pursue the shamanism side. But thank you, that's a great question. Okay, I don't know, Marisa, if you have a, another final question, otherwise we'll just thank Tatiana. I, I think that's a good good place to, to wrap up. If... So well, thank well, you again. No, thank you so much for giving me the chance to talk and thank you for those lovely questions and I'm going to think about them, you know, some more. Um, so it's, it, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Bye-bye.